Welcome back to Candy Adventures. I'm Chris. And I'm Elizabeth. And we live full time as nomads back here in this truck camper. We're currently in the desert of Nevada to film the most controversial video any truck camper channel has ever done. Has ever dared to do. We are going <laughs> to tackle a subject that is going to divide our audience probably directly in half. Right at betwixt our audience. You're either going to love this or hate it. But we're going to represent both sides and you can make the decision in the comments what side uh, you go, you align with, let's say. Some uh, things you've probably noticed in the media is the controversial use or controversial use, lack thereof, of barbed wire by the federal government. Um, fences to keep things in and out. And the cost associated with maintaining tight restrictive borders. And when is it just time to let things go of those borders and just let things be natural? So we're going to explore that today and we're going to do it through the use of our electric bicycle uh, back here, which was sent to us by Rattan. And we have about 30 miles of e-biking to do today to get to where we're going to go down a very bumpy road. So we're going to pack up. I'm going to let some pr tire pressure out of these bikes and we're going to go find this mysterious divisive Thing. out here uh, <laughs> in the desert and see what you think about it. So we've worked with Rattan a couple times um, and we really like their bikes. We're not going to go into a detailed review for this bike, but just know that we do have one on our second review channel and we are going to put it to the test today for this adventure. Let's pony up. This is going to be a long bumpy ride <laughs> into controversy or controversy, controversy depending on where you're watching from. Oh. So here's our little bag we'll be taking, and we will be taking, because it is so long in the desert, we do have uh, an air pump, I have the little uh, multi-tool wrench, and I have a one tire iron, and then I have a wrench that'll fit the axles in case we need to do a flat change, and then I have a patch kit. I also have, because we're taking e-bikes, and this one has the extra battery extended, extended range, so I don't have to worry about battery today, is we can use heavy things and Whoa. really load the bike down in the back rack. So this is fix a flat. Sometimes you can just use this to get away with actually having to break your uh, tube out on the trail and fix it. So I have used this to some success and because we have uh, plenty of storage and range capability today, I'm gonna be a little heavier. We'll also be taking uh, plenty of water just in case we were to break down and end up having to walk back or something goes wrong. Uh, we always take plenty of water out here because there's no streams, there's no nothing, no cell phone service. So always have some of this handy. I can't express enough how much we love these PetSmart baskets. PetSmarts, if you would like to sponsor us for using one of your stolen products. Um, <laughs> we didn't steal it, it was already stolen. <laughs> yeah, we just found it. Also, if you can't tell by Chris's beautiful locks whipping around in the wind, we've uh, got unfavorable weather today. Um, not working in our favor, but it should be fine. It's just some big gusts. It's very windy. We're learning more and more every day that it is very windy in the desert, always, just about always. We made it through the hardest part. We have been camped up this valley on this road. We always like to camp on a little rougher road, so we don't. We haven't seen any people in several days. No, but it makes for a an uncomfy ride, no matter how nice the e-bike is to go over that rugged terrain. So yeah, super bumpy, but we made it through that part. Um, <laughs> about 30 minutes of riding on that really rough road. Now we got to this big, nice. Uh, desert super highway gravel road which will be a nice uh, relaxing ride for the rest of our time the rest of our time will be headed going that way for about uh, seven or eight more miles I yeah. think roughly if you're wondering um, this bike has a charging port and so I'm actually charging my phone at the same time as we're riding so it's kind of nice I can just charge this while I ride and it doesn't really drain a lot of battery continuing on like one of those dreams where the hallway just keeps going on forever and ever no matter how far you go 
This is never reaching the end. <laughs> We've been going down this straightaway for like 30 minutes and it just feels like we're not any closer. We are, but it just doesn't look like it. All right, so we got to this little bridge and heard a very familiar sound being East Coast people. <laughs> uh, and there's some running water down here in the middle of the desert, which is super cool and these little springs. And wiggling around down there, I can see little fish. So if you gathered from the sign, we are on the Ash Meadows Wildlife Refuge, which is known for their pup fish population. There are multiple species here, and you can find different species through different parts of the park. Really neat little fish because they, they exist out here in these oases in the middle of the desert. We'll show you on a map or something right here. We're in the middle of no water, but there's little springs, natural springs, ground fed springs out here. And these little fish exist pretty much out here in these little islands of uh, ecosystem. But I think there was introduced uh, mosquito fish in here, which were, uh, I think, primarily an East Coast fish. Really neat, some big crayfish in there. I don't know if they're native or introduced. You're not gonna dive in there for that crawdad? I want to so bad, <laughs> but I don't know, because this is a refuge, a wildlife refuge. I don't know if you're allowed to like touch the water or like, I don't know what you're allowed to do here. And we're on YouTube, so it's, here's all the evidence of doing the thing you're not supposed to do. According to the rules, you are not allowed to touch any of the water except for one body called Crystal Lake Dam. Oh. That's it. Right. Yeah. So here we are uh, at this gated off little portion. This is actually part of Death Valley National Park, which is interesting because it doesn't actually touch Death Valley National Park. It's uh, like a little offshoot island uh, kind of over here on the in Nevada. But this is a little map to show you. So the desert pupfish, this is an actual two size representation of desert pupfish. And they're very small. And then they exist in California uh, in the Eastern Sierras, up here in Bishop, and then down here throughout uh, parts of Death Valley. And then where we are here, over here in uh, Ash Meadows area. And you can see to the layman, uh, these fish all look the same. They just look the same to the layman. Other than a scientist, if you were to put these fish against that fish, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And that's what makes our little story here uh, so divisive, I think, is that all these fish, um, I think used to be all this was, a lot more of this was water and all these guys uh, would have been probably the same species. And then as the climate started changing and all this started drying up and turning into desert, each individual little spring around here on the map, uh, that little that little area of fish kind of slightly evolved to be a little bit different from the other one. So if you look at that picture and that picture, I don't exactly know what the scientific differences are, but it's something. So then each little pocket of freshwater groundwater spring uh, made its own little version of pupfish and and these particular guys over here in uh, fish Guantanamo Bay um, is the most divisive of all of the fish. Fish Guantanamo Bay. I'm gonna let Elizabeth get into the scientistic the scientistics of this situation <laughs> but for someone like me that doesn't like a lot of government big government spending I'll go ahead and lay it out. I, I'm not a super big fan of spending millions of dollars to fence off and feed them <laughs> so that this one little species of minnow with a slightly different stripe uh, is, is protected while we have lots of other species that they're not a lynch uh, a keystone species. Yeah. Um, so there's homeless people and all kinds of other problems and we're doing this. So I'm against <laughs> it. I'll let Elizabeth talk about the science. <laughs> Devil's Hole became part of the park system in 1952 by proclamation by President Harry Truman. Um, and it was due to both the ecosystem and also because of a peculiar race of fish. And that's our Devil's Hole pupfish. As Chris hinted as to why this species is divisive is because you could see on that diagram there are multiple species of pupfish. But this specific one that we're going to look at has very tight security and millions of dollars of funding behind the preservation of this species. Around the 1960s in this area, there was growing agriculture and uh, drawing of water from the aquifers. It was actually lowering the water table and the aquifer, and it was threatening the preservation of these fish. So some of the scientists started 
a campaign to stop the withdrawal of water in the area and protect this species. And it became so controversial that people had bumper stickers that either said kill all the pupfish or save all the pupfish. And it got to a Supreme Court case level about whether or not it was worth it to save these fish in this specific hole. The Devil's Hole pupfish was listed as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Preservation Act. You can see, it looks like a prison from the outside. There's a chain link fence with barbed wire. Oh my gosh. It's as close as you can get. So this is as close as a taxpayer can get right here, uh, is that hole down there um, where they monitor the pH levels for the fish. And the dissolved oxygen and the amount of algae. They feed them. Uh, and Five then, times a week. So it's managed by continuously monitoring the water level. So we have two transducers, so a redundant system. We have it set to a telemetry system so we can actually type in and say, what's the water level doing now? We also, you can see here, we have this uh, a blue instrument hanging in the water. That's a water quality sonde. So it measures temperature, pH, oxygen, and conductivity at 15 minute intervals. So this facility, this specific location, has 24 seven security surveillance in addition to this uh, restrictive wall, this restrictive cage. And then around the cage is still the barbed wire fence that goes all the way around this hole. And the, the water in this cave is very, very deep. So it's not that they were that they were at risk of like all the water evaporating and drying up. It's it's hundreds of feet deep, I believe, in here. It's over 400 feet deep, and they live in the first 80 feet. And they're very picky. They've tried to retransplant this very specific species of pupfish in other places, and they have a really hard time growing it. So it becomes of how much money do you throw at this fish in the desert? Yeah. Um, that probably would go extinct on its own. The Devil's Hole pupfish is unique because it lives in pretty much the worst environment that you can think of to be a fish. Like water is a constant 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Dissolved oxygen is at lethally low levels. And in the winter, there's no direct sunlight on the Devil's Hole. So what happens is there's no photosynthesis to drive that food web. The algae die out, the pupfish eat what's, whatever's there, and the system goes into a food limitation. And so there's an annual mortality of fish in that system. After the multiple attempts for breeding, like Chris talked about, which who knows how much that costs, they made a facility just a mile from here for breeding efforts and it was 4.5 million and the estimate for yearly upkeep is 250,000 to replicate the conditions of this exact hole. It's been working so far. Um, the population is up to about 200 individuals. We've created a 110,000 gallon habitat recreation. And it's largely computer driven that is connected to a mechanical room filled with filtration, um, ultraviolet sterilization, heating and thermal control systems to be able to replicate the really challenging environment of Devil's Hole. And Chris also mentioned keystone species earlier. If you've not heard of that term, a keystone species is an animal in an ecosystem that if, they're, if they were taken out or if they were extinct, it would cause this cascading effect of everything above or below it dying off because it's not present anymore. These fish are not considered a keystone species because there's only specific types of algae and a beetle and themselves that kind of operate in this hole. They are actually known to have the smallest range of any vertebrate in the entire world and they're also known to be the most inbred <laughs> species of the entire world. Everybody kind of has their own thoughts about one, government spending, and two, um, preservation of wildlife or conservation, which are two different concepts. But uh, this fish kind of combines all of those into one very divisive opinion on whether or not you think we should spend money on protecting the species or just let it do its thing by itself. But from biologists or people within the wildlife research 
community or profession, it's just as divisive, if not more. You'll have a spectrum of wildlife biologists that want to save everything possible, no matter how much money um, or how much time or effort, you want to try to save everything because biodiversity is very important. Then you have the opposite end of the spectrum, which is if it can't survive, it's probably gonna die out on its own and we shouldn't intervene because humans are a part of the ecosystem. And then I would say the majority of biologists kind of fall somewhere in the middle and it just depends on the species and uh, why it's starting to go um, towards extinction. But this fish specifically, aside from the water being drawn down by um, agriculture, which has now stopped, this fish uh, is affected by flash floods and it's also affected by earthquakes. So they've actually had three earthquakes um, in here and it disturbed this shelf in there where their algae grows that they consume and they, it, it affected their food source. So two things that are not human impacts that affect this fish to the point where it could go instinct from one uh, natural disaster as opposed to being a human effect. Back in the 90s, Bill Clinton said he was going to balance the budget. He was going to get rid of this massive uh, federal deficit. Since that time, I think that federal deficit has ballooned like five or ten times over. And if you've ever watched one of those hearings where they like open up the back of uh, these funding bills and stuff and they'll, they'll show how much money gets spent on crazy things. This is over $800,000 to study whether or not Japanese quail are more sexually promiscuous on cocaine. So a couple of years ago, they gave money for autism. Well, that's a, something we ought to study, autism. Well, they subcontracted 700 grand of it to watch Neil Armstrong's statement on the moon. You remember the black and white photo? He's on the moon and he says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, or did he really say one small step for a man? And we spent 700 grand listening to the tape over and over and over again. And you know what they determined? They just can't decide. They're unsure, but they did recommend more money. I think if the American public just knew more about how much money goes to stuff like this, um, I think maybe some stuff would start getting done and we could start fixing bridges and doing something about the homeless population and the mental health epidemic because we don't have anywhere to house people who have mental health issues, so we just throw them on the streets um, while we're out here with a, a, a fish that's a slightly different coloring of some kind that, from a fish that's literally right across the street that's not in a big fence um, that we spend millions of dollars in doing this. People make their whole careers here. Their whole career will be spent with these desert pupfish scientists. Their whole life will be measuring and feeding and checking the pH water of these caged fish. Yeah. I don't think anything should just go extinct, especially if it's human cause. And I, but this species is just slightly different from all the other desert pupfish all throughout the area. That are not uh, protected in the same way. Mm -mm. Yeah. People get into these jobs and they, they write a reason for their job to continue to exist. This is a big problem in the government. It's called job security. And how many times do you need to measure this fish? How many times do you need to count how many algae or how it breeds or how, what, what, how can your knowledge be applied to other fish or to a greater situation? And, yep. I, and here I don't think it can. I think it's just people writing papers so that next year they can write more papers and, and write more papers and get paid to do it. And it's easy job security. And Chris doesn't have a, a wildlife research background, but when I was in Guam with the brown tree snake, research that they have going on there. I think every year by the government, they're afforded millions of dollars to keep researching brown tree snakes. And uh, it just felt more like we were pumping out research papers as opposed to like trying to fix the invasive species problem. Because every year in colleges, you have a doctoral pipeline of new students coming in and they have to write a paper on something. They yep. have to have a thesis on something. So when you pick something like this hole, every year a new student can come in and write a paper that is exactly the same as the kid from last year. But, well, but slightly different. But slightly different. Yeah. How, how long are these pupfish? And then the guy next year is going to write a paper that says, how long are these pupfish from January to August? We have a fish <laughs> in the same area that is just over the hill in a yes. lake that is... Um, it doesn't age. 
it just grows and grows and lives and lives and it doesn't have cellular deterioration like the rest of vertebrates and they don't know why. Buffalo fish also don't seem to suffer from the effects of age. They do not seem to physically decline the way that humans do. The big mouth buffalo fish kind of gets better with age, which seems grossly unfair, really. And nobody is dumping that kind of money into that fish. And that's like a recent discovery too. It was just random. But I just think that if you have X amount of money in the world to spend to, to take money away from what could have been Parkinson's research uh, or MS research or cancer research or... Um, or other species that are struggling that are just not uh, well known the, or popular. Or they're, they're struggling more because more of human impact. Because yes, we're like doing anything related to fisheries. Mono agriculture and we're just using huge swaths of land and things are losing their habitat and stuff for that. But for, for this... I just think the money could be spent on literally anything else. It can be hard as someone that works in this field to also be the one to come out and question whether or not funding should be spent. It can isolate you from the rest of the academic wildlife community. So I could see how there would be a lot of people that wouldn't want to speak out or against this because it looks like you're speaking against U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the National Park Service, um, any federal funding that goes towards this. It. Uh, kind of makes you seem like the villain if you're not for saving something because it sounds like you just want it to die. But realistically, there has to be a balance with funding because money isn't limitless. Maybe in some cases, depending on what the job is it is, but for wildlife conservation, money is not limitless and you have to pick and choose what you can allot funding to, what people will care about because uh, Public perception is another big portion of wildlife conservation. If the public is not on board with saving a specific species or researching a specific species, it can cause a lot of um, public distrust with government and with uh, any of the agencies that are affiliated, which has already happened with this fish. A lot of this comes down to how do you measure value of putting money or funding or desire towards saving a species. What is that value dependent on? Some people think that you shouldn't look at the value of a species in an environment, that it exists and purely from its existence and the fact that humans have an effect on it, we should save it because it's our responsibility um, and we're the only ones capable. So leave in the comments what you think. but. I've known about this fish since I was in high school. When did you hear about it? Uh, probably about the same. So this, this fish has kind of been known for a while and um, maybe you've heard it mentioned on Animal Planet or the news at one point, but let us know what you think. Uh, no opinion I think is wrong on these things. It's kind of a matter of, I don't know, your heart and where your morals lie and also what you think of the value of money. All right, we're gonna go hop back on our uh, bicicletas and it's gonna be about an hour or an hour and a half ride back. And I am so glad we have e-bikes right now because this wind, ped awful. pedaling straight into desert wind is the most quad burning thing on planet Earth. <laughs> um, but I'm super excited because I think we're gonna go have a, a little supper and uh, we'll see you guys, we'll hop back on the bike so we can get back and cook some dinner. See you guys back at the camper. Oh boy, everybody made it back. Good girl. Did you have a good nap? Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. All right, what I'm going to do while that sun is on its way down, uh, that's where we came from, way back over there, uh, so we got a lot of miles in today, is start to gather some firewood. We have a little fire ring here, um, but the problem is you can see there's no trees, and all we have is these creosote bushes. But at the base of them, a lot of times, there are dead branches um, like that, completely dead and dry. So I'm going to go around and collect a bunch of this little uh, miniature firewood and so we can get our dinner going because we are starving. We have not eaten today. You gonna help him? 
We made it back only to realize we've been running a little bit low on supplies and we kind of need to make a supply run. So I think for dinner we can scrounge something together. And what we've decided is to make meatball musubi. Um, we have some of these armor meatballs in our little <laughs> portable freezer that we keep with us. And um, I have this, Whoa. I have this uh, <laughs> extendable hot dog stick that I'm gonna cook the meatballs over the fire so we don't have to dirty anything up or clean anything. And also we don't have, we forgot our grill. Yeah. So I think we're, we're not going to be uh, fully musubi Asian style. It's going to be like an Americana influence. We ate our can of Spam last <laughs> night, yeah. and I didn't think about this ahead of time, that we did not have a backup can of Spam. So instead of Spam, it's going to be meatballs, and we don't have egg either. So uh, I got this random can of Japanese vegetables. It's like a sweet pickled relish of Japanese sweet pickle. It's very good. Uh, I taste tested it because we, we, we can't, <laughs> read, no the, idea what we can't read the label, but it tastes good. <laughs> If you don't know what musubi is, it is uh, kind of like a quick snack sandwich. Instead of a bun, it is rice on the top and bottom, and then it's kept together with a wrap of seaweed. And then in between the rice are your meaty layers, which uh, is usually spam and egg, but we're gonna do meatballs and the vegetable stuff. And of course, uh, she's just stolen the firewood to entertain herself. It instantly smells like Burger King, which is in the top three best smells that humans have ever been able to produce. What are some other contenders? <laughs> I don't think uh, it's a family channel. <laughs> I've never had flame broiled meatballs before, Ooh, but they are absolutely delicious. <laughs> now you can see I've been testing as I've been spinning out here. Because they're a little black on the outside. Mm -hmm. But they are so good. Uh, that that frame, flame broiling really, uh, really does something to those pre-made frozen meatballs. <laughs> Elizabeth found this and it's like pickled, crunchy, uh, Fuku Jinzuki uh, seasoned vegetable to Tokyo Zuki style. It is delicious. It reminds me of kimchi, but not spicy. And it's a little bit sweet. And it's crunchy. It's sweet and crunchy. And then I want to do one <laughs> Arby's style. I want to make one like a Arby's, an Arby's musubi um, because we have uh, Arby's sauce. <laughs> And a can of this cheese that's dented so it was cheaper. So <laughs> I want to make one like Arby's. We'll make okay. one a little more traditional Japanese style and one a little bit uh, not. And this kind of becomes your shape. Meatballs in there. Now we got another layer of uh, our sticky rice to form it. Push it out the bottom. And there you go. There is your meatball musubi. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and give it a shot here. Good. That's delicious. Now I want to try the Arby's one. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do a little layer <laughs> of uh, nacho cheese, just like Arby's would do in a beef and cheddar. She going to be messy, but delicious. That's a good one. Look at that one. Perfect. Look how delicious that looks. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> oh my gosh. Look at that delicious little that bad looks boy. Good. Look at that delicious little bad boy, little Arby's. I'm gonna let Elizabeth try this one. Oh no. That one was packed down good. Look at that. Look at that pretty sunset back there <laughs> through our windows. Oh yeah, I forgot the windows as are down. As you watch us put this hot brown mush <laughs> in our mouth.
That was so good. <laughs> it's like a burger with a taste of seaweed. That's very good. <laughs> and Arby's. Yeah. But I mean, like, it just tastes like a cheeseburger with, with a little bit of Arby's sauce. All right. I think that's going to be the end of the video for today. <laughs> uh, as we're going to continue pounding away on our Mosadie. sweet treats, we're going to head outside and finish watching this beautiful sunset, uh, which is so cool about a soft sided camper. We can see it from all directions. But we're going to watch that beautiful sunset and fire. sit by the fire with Mona because she had to get left behind today. Oh, and then we'll see you guys next video.